Hello my friends, a casual self-analysis video today. I wanted to make this video because my friend Dead Fox over on their channel made a video about the games that inspired them to work in the video game industry and it had me thinking what games I wanted to highlight as the games that most inspired me to see video games as a medium for philosophy and want to essentially become a philosopher, and specifically a philosopher of games, a philosopher that uses games as the medium to convey meaning. But before we get into it, just a little housekeeping. If you've been a viewer of mine for a little while and would like to chat with other people who are interested in these same topics, the channel does have a Discord server called the Socratetris Symposium, which you can easily join through the link in the description. I hope you will. And if you really like this channel and would like to help my videos improve directly, you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash Socratetris where one of the key perks is that you get access to any and all of my video scripts early, and you can comment on them and critique them directly, and your critiques can result in direct changes or expansions of the topic. So it's a great way to make your voices heard and turn the channel into even more of a dialogue. I hope you'll consider whether that option is right for you. And lastly, I have began consistently streaming on Twitch, over at twitch.tv slash Socratetris for the past few weeks, and if anyone is interested, feel free to hop on over there and give me a follow so that we can reach that coveted first 50 followers. And that's it. Now that all of the house cleaning is done, let's get to the topic at hand. The very first game that inspired me to pursue philosophy more seriously is Nier. And that may not come as a surprise to you because Nier has made a substantial presence on this channel over the past few years. I first encountered Nier when I was studying abroad in Japan uh, for a single summer semester and basically encountered it in the used bargain bin of a what was essentially a Japanese blockbuster on the corner between my dorm and the train station. The cover art just had a very weird aesthetic, and that alone was enough for me to say, hey, let me pick up this weird Japanese game I've never seen before. Unfortunately, I didn't have a console with me while I was in Japan, so I had to wait until it was back in the fall semester when I was back in the States to be able to play it on my PlayStation 3. Of course it was entirely in Japanese, no English whatsoever, and I had to manage my way through it as best I could using what limited Japanese I had learned and had retained from my time uh, abroad. And really it was my lack of information about what was going on in the story and what my options were that allowed me to have a single moment of gameplay that cued me into the themes of the game before I was able to go back with Nier Gestalt, the English version, and have a more specific understanding. Namely that I was fighting on a bridge against a giant eyeball monster in an area of the game called the Airy. And during that sequence, a bunch of enemies called Shades were supposedly taking over the bodies or disguising themselves as the regular villagers of that town. And while I was trying to fend them off, there were also town guards that were running around doing the same or attacking me and I was doing my best to make it so that I didn't kill any of the town guards and just focused on killing the shades that had revealed themselves, and I kept killing town guards over and over, and I retried multiple times to try to get through that segment without killing town guards even though it didn't impede me from completing my goal. And that was the first thing that cued me in too near as a message about the nature of power and how humans relate to power, how power gets out of our hands and out of control, even if we are the one wielding it. And it was through that first insight that I was led to play the game in English and look at all of its constituent parts to 
suss out a much more specific narrative. And it was that analysis that helped me to see the potential games had to have their different elements, their rules and their narrative connections to gameplay to be lined up as an argument that can lead to a conclusion and one that people can experience intuitively through play without having to actually engage in a formal dialogue because the medium of dialogue was play, was interaction. The dialogue was tactile, not vocal. And that potential was extremely inspiring to me. The second game that really made me see video games as a further potential for direct and scholastic philosophy was a game called The Talos Principle, where a completely optional aspect of the game was to click on these old-style computers and have a conversation with an artificial intelligence that was situated to discuss what your purpose in the game was and to cause you to evaluate your condition not just as the artificial intelligence that made up the main character but you as the player in your actual life because it engaged the artificial intelligence using real world philosophies as well as a specific fake philosopher that the game made up in order to facilitate the messages that it wanted to propose and discuss without actually forming a conclusion on. The game was hyper-focused on gamifying dialogue and specifically making that dialogue a discussion of philosophies that ran you through the gambit of trying to feel like you needed to win a conversation to just trying to give information to help out other people or other players in the world to having a conversation just for the fun of it to see what ideas come out of it no attempt at goodwill or an attempt at one-upsmanship at all and i see the potential of the talus principle in that it is a game and therefore it motivates people to actually play it to try to solve the puzzles and get to the end using its setting and its mechanics but at the same time while it distracts you with playing a video game it it demonstrates that a philosophical dialogue can be so many different things and that it can be accessible to the average person to anybody who comes along and starts talking about any of the subjects. And something that's always frustrated me when engaging with philosophy is that people often give up too quickly when it comes to trying to think about the great ideas that have formed the foundation of culture. Anyone can engage in a philosophical dialogue, but often there's just trepidation for trying to get past that first barrier of not wanting to break social norms or not wanting to come off as stupid against someone who is already educated in the area. And I wish I had a more uh, concise and consistent way that I could demonstrate to people that foreknowledge of philosophy, its history, and who the great thinkers are is absolutely not necessary to actually engage in philosophy in a way that is interesting and can improve your life. I guess the best metaphor that I can draw with having a conversation with a, I guess, philosophical amateur is that in martial arts and combat sports when you spar no matter how good you get you always want to still spar with people who have never had any training because people who don't train in martial arts can and often do surprising things that you wouldn't expect that you wouldn't predict from someone who is trained and has more consistent or reliable patterns and being able to respond to the unpredictable makes a trained fighter better at executing and responding with their training. And the same can be said for a philosopher. 
someone who is not familiar with the practice can come up with an idea that is completely out of left field, that is not standard to the tradition, and essentially force you to come up with some reply, or often to just say, I don't know, let me get back to you, or I don't know, let's think about this topic together and come to an answer. So the Talos Principle is number two because it's a way of getting people to have that first philosophical discussion, an actual formal philosophy-based discussion in a completely safe but also completely engaging way. And the last game for this video is going to be, what else? Bloodborne. Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 and the other From Software games, but primarily Bloodborne, demonstrated to me that you can achieve a ludonarrative resonance with your game in a very simple and straightforward way. From Soft games are so famous for their obfuscation of information in order to tell a very subtle story that is missing pieces, and that alone can motivate a lot of people to go and try to uncover the lore. But I think what's more interesting to me is that beyond uncovering lore, there is a lot of information about what your character is and what your character is doing held entirely within the player stats. Both my Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 philosophy of games videos spent a good deal of time actually looking at the stat blocks and trying to understand what it means to be simultaneously engaging with elements that the world, the setting of the game, is trying to tell you are at odds or aren't compatible. And so these simple RPG mechanics take on a, a sort of personal ontology where the mystery is not just what is going on in the world and what is the story that's unfolding, but who are you as a person and what does being that person mean? I feel as though I'm probably explaining it in an esoteric way, just like the games do. So let me put it like this. I praise Nier a lot for its ludonarrative resonance, its connection of the game's themes to game mechanics through metaphorical association. But the way Nier achieves this is to essentially make every single aspect of the game, no matter how small, be a reflection of whatever message they are trying to get across, and that is sustained both in the original Nier and in Nier Automata. Bloodborne, on the other hand, does it very simply in that only one or two stats on your character block are going to have a metaphorical significance, a metaphorical attachment to the larger themes of the game's story and the player gets to engage with those themes by choosing whether or not to engage with those stats and what those stats do for them. And whether or not they choose to engage with those stats doesn't outshine the agency that comes with being able to take certain actions to choose an ending of the game, or at least try to choose an ending of the game if you are on a first playthrough and you don't really understand what's going on. I use Bloodborne in particular because I feel as though of all of the Souls-like games, Bloodborne actually has the most straightforward story and the most straightforward law, if only because it is entirely self-contained. It takes very careful attention, for sure, but by looking at all the information that is presented to you through item descriptions, through your player stats, you can really predict what that third and true ending is going to be. And at the time of release, when people were first getting to their first endings of their first playthroughs, 
So many people were extremely surprised and confused at that third ending, and it caused people to spend a lot of time analyzing it and trying to suss out how the heck your player character goes from everything they've experienced to becoming a god in the form of a slug. But ultimately, the entire point of the story, the themes of the mind-body paradox that are in Bloodborne were entirely delivered in just a few item descriptions, 8 to 12 item descriptions max, if depending on how you want to count them. And it was the simplicity of the delivery in Bloodborne that really inspired me to be able to look at games themselves as a work of scholarship, or part of the mission statement of the channel. And it taught me to never turn my nose up at a game on its face because no matter how simple the game, if there is even one aspect that presents some kind of metaphorical significance that player agency can engage with, then the game can be said to be philosophical. And the marvelous thing about games is that to be philosophical, the bar is low. It's so low for a game to have philosophy in it, to be philosophy to some extent. Other media requires foreknowledge of formal philosophers, the ability to engage intellectually with them, the ability to say something profound, and that's a very specific skill set. With video games, the idea can be felt in your hands and your experience, it's an embodied knowledge, and the only real thing I'm trying to do with this channel is to expose that embodied knowledge in a very direct way with my words. And to a certain extent, I, I completely accept this reality, I have an idea in my head that my videos, no matter how good they are, are redundant that on some base level, some aspect of any idea I could possibly say about a game is already understood by the people who play it. And so the people who watch the video having played the game come to it just getting a more formal description of something they've already learned. And it's amazing to me to think that every person who shares my love for this hobby is already in some way an intellectual. So I feel as though I am surrounded by intellectuals that no one else is paying attention to or has an opportunity to talk to. So I honestly consider myself lucky. I consider myself lucky to be on the forefront of a new philosophical medium. And I suppose that's enough getting very overly emotional about my passions. So let's go ahead and wrap the video up with one last announcement. A few months ago, I finished and published a long-term project that I've been working on a book. A book about the nature of philosophy in video games, which I called Controller Revolution, Why Video Games Are the Future of Philosophy. I do plan on making a formal book trailer on my channel sometime soon, but if you are interested in picking it up now, you can find it in one of two places. You can either follow the link to Amazon in the description to purchase it as an ebook or on paperback there, or if you subscribe to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Socratatris self shill you can get a free PDF of the book in full by joining the $10 support tier. And very soon, within the next couple months, I will be releasing a supplement book called Ludolectic, the Gospel of Game Literacy, as a practical companion to the theory that I wrote of in Controller Revolution which will also be made available for anyone who joins at the $10 reward tier, as well as on Amazon, but I figure that anyone who has the goodwill to support me on Patreon deserves to get any and all of my writings 
without having to spend anything extra. But that's all I have for you today. I'm really glad that you stuck around for this very informal video. I have a very big project planned for the end of the year. Formal scripted videos are coming, but I just ask for some patience so that I can get this bigger plan that I have to go off without a hitch. But in the meantime, lots of scripts are being written, and like I said, you have the opportunity to comment on them directly by going to my Patreon. But no pressure. No pressure, though. I hope to see you in the next video. And remember, stay true.